Welcome. Hello and Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you for joining us today on January 19th. Um, my name is Christine Perret. I'm the chair of the Area Research Committee. Um, approximately on a monthly basis, we share um, information. We invite um, researchers to give us a webinar, tell us about um, activities they're working on, um, new, new uh, thoughts, new code in this case, <laughs> and, um, and, and share those with us so that we can all be um, better at our jobs. Before I hand it over to today's guests, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the area and how we um, achieve our goals. And then we'll be hearing from Anthony Rowe and Nuna Pereira. And then there'll be some time at the end for questions from uh, you, the audience. If you have questions, please, please type them into the question console, a question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, I'll be checking on those and sharing them with our, our guest speakers here today at the end. <clears throat> you are in listen-only mode. So we'll be um, hearing this talk um, without interruptions. So the area's purpose and is to uh, fuel and accelerate the development of the enterprise augmented reality ecosystem. And we like to take a very holistic view of the ecosystem. We think of the companies who are adopting and implementing augmented reality as the top of the pyramid, the enterprises of all sizes, but most of the time very large enterprises with um, a lot of people, a lot of equipment, and um, complex processes. And then supporting the enterprises are the providers of technology and services, so services, software, hardware, of course displays, but many other components are necessary for enterprise augmented reality. And then on the other side, on the right-hand side of this um, triangle, are the non-commercial entities. And they are pushing the envelope. And as those who are going to be speaking today um, will be telling you, they're, they're experimenting and driving new research that then can be adopted by both the enterprises as well as the providers of technologies in the future. And we support the ecosystem, the growth of the ecosystem, in four ways. We call these our pillars. Um, we develop content and, and we demonstrate the thought leadership of our members through many different forms. We have a, a website, we have uh, social media, of course, but we have white papers and uh, many different media types, including webinars. So do encourage you to um, come to the area.org website and visit the content because it's, it's, it's objective, it's independent and neutral. We provide our members, as well as the whole community, a place to connect, um, to reflect, and to share experiences. That's our networking and marketplace uh, pillar. We, we are very aware, acutely aware, of the fact that there is a shortage of people who are trained in the domain of enterprise augmented reality. So. We hope to be working, and, and we are working with programs that train people um, in augmented reality, most more specifically, the kinds of uh, skills that people need to work in, in enterprise AR teams and projects. And finally, we try to uh, reduce barriers to adoption through our committees. We have uh, a variety of committees, and the research committee is one of those. So that's the very, very brief introduction to who the area is and how we achieve our goals. And now I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over to um, Anthony and Nuno and ask them to first introduce themselves and then share with us what they've been working on. And as an aside, I should say also that I learned about their research 
when they presented and received some uh, recognition for their work um, at the ISMAR, the IEEE International Symposium of Mixed and Augmented Reality, last October. We met uh, in person, actually, <laughs> in California in the fall, and I'm very delighted to have you here with us. Welcome, gentlemen. Cool, thank you. So can you uh, see our screen and hear us? Yes, we see it very well, and we hear you perfectly. Thanks. Great, awesome, thank you. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about two things. Um, one is this arena platform, which we're designing, where we're gonna give a little bit of a technical deep dive, but also uh, we're gonna be discussing this Connex Research Center, which is actually the program that um, that funds the research that, that led to arena. But maybe before we get started, um, a little bit of a background about us. Yeah, absolutely. So. I'm uh, Nuno, Nuno Pereira, and I'm from Porto, Portugal, and I'm currently at uh, in the US at Carnegie Mellon University as a visiting scholar. My uh, research in the past has been about real-time in embedded systems with applications in data centers, automotive, avionics, but since a few years back, I've been working in Connex and specifically in the platform we're going to tell you about uh, uh, the augmented reality edge networking architecture that we say it's called ARENA. Um, yeah, so cool. Anthony. And my, uh, my name is Anthony Rowe. I'm a professor in the electrical and computer engineering department here at CMU. And my background is nominally in embedded sensing systems. I've done a lot of work in the past in wireless communication. And in the last few years leading up to my interest in AR, I did a lot of GPS denied position navigation and timing. So I got really into localization and tracking. And that's kind of what got me connected with the whole mixed reality space. Um, and now a, a lot of my research group is just sort of full speed into uh, into mixed reality. So to start off today, I want to talk about the uh, Connex Research Center. So Connex, it's a little bit of a, a mouthful, but it stands for Compute on the Network Infrastructure for Pervasive Perception, Cognition, and Action Systems. This is a semiconductor research corporation, SRC sponsored research center um, that spans a bunch of different universities, so six different universities and many PIs. And for those that aren't familiar with SRC, SRC is actually a research consortium that's comprised of a lot of the main semiconductor companies in the US. So uh, folks like Intel, ADI, Texas Instruments, um, that's also has match funding from the government. So DARPA and some defense organizations. So these uh, SRC actually funds a number of these different research centers right now, six of them. They're at the tune of around $30 million each and they have a span for of about five years and then they go through kind of a, a changing cycle to match the the dynamics of sort of industry needs linked back to academia so i want to start off uh, by explaining a little bit of the mission of the connex research center and sort of the the people involved so the backdrop to what we're doing in connex is we're really looking at the future of distributed computing and one thing that we noticed is that in current distributed systems we've gotten really good at this sort of three-tiered architecture with cloud, network, and edge that all work great together, um, but they're very siloed. So for example, in the cloud, we've gotten great at doing data management, machine learning, resource management. Um, at the edge, we have all sorts of new sensors and actuators. We have, for example, mixed reality headsets. Um, but if you think about sort of next generation and future computing systems, uh, what we see is that if you care about latency and dynamics, so if, for example, your AR headset needs to communicate with industrial IoT with low latency, the normal up and down communication pattern going in and out of the cloud really breaks down and gets disrupted. And we need to think more about how we can build systems that have agile sort of internetworked communication. And so really in the Connex Research Center, our challenge is prototyping a new runtime for these types of distributed systems. And we actually uh, have focused largely on sort of mixed reality systems as, as our driver to that. And our general philosophy within the Connex Research Center is first and foremost, try to virtualize all of the resources. So in, cloud, in the cloud world and in data centers, we've gotten really good at virtualizing memory, disk, um, network interconnect. When you take this out into sort of a broader scope out in the, the real world, you need to start thinking about virtualizing uh, sensors and actuators in the environment. And then, of course, the other mandate is pushing as much intelligence as we can into and around 
uh, the network. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, some of the work that's been going on in 5G and edge computing, and this is really uh, right in our right in the middle of our wheelhouse. Um, just to give you a, a quick flavor for the team, I'm not going to go through all of these folks, um, but we have uh, sort of a corpus at, at Carnegie Mellon University over in Pittsburgh. We have another large team at, at UC Berkeley, and then you can see uh, the other schools, UCLA, USC, UC San Diego, George Washington, University of Washington. And maybe one thing to highlight about all of these folks is they span a really broad breadth of topics. We have people from communications, robotics, um, human computer interactions, programming languages, computer systems, networking, all coming together um, to work on, on this one sort of single vision, which is actually really pretty exciting. And it's um, one of these rare, like uh, cross university efforts in that space. So from that perspective, SRC has been a fantastic, uh, a fantastic sponsor. So to talk a little bit about the center, I'm gonna give a very, very brief overview of kind of the different layers of the stack and just a high level of what people are working on in each slice. Um, each one of these, I can sort of go into a full uh, 45 minute hour talk. I'll spare you uh, th that level of detail, but at least it'll give a little bit of the backdrop for how we got to ARENA. Um, so we have a couple of sort of horizontal uh, themes as we call them, research themes, starting from hardware, software systems, building up to communication, programming languages, and then of course, uh, driver applications. And then we have a few of these vertical uh, themes where we look at machine learning and security that actually cut across all of these different layers. And one of the sort of main things that I'll, I'll get to in theme one up here is that our main sort of driver application that brings all of our different technologies together is really around distributed digital twins, mixed reality, because it elicits a lot of the sort of interesting problems that happen when you have highly variable spatiotemporal diversity in a distributed system. And so um, in terms of the actual end use case applications uh, in industrial IoT, so we see ourselves looking at sort of mixed reality meets the IoT world. We've been looking at things like how to build the uh, sensors, softwares, and platforms for interactive virtual coaching, sort of uh, dry, uh, guiding people through complex tasks, virtual staging and configuration of factory floors, um, maybe things as you know comparatively simple as navigation and asset tracking, or um, looking at uh, virtual and physical co-simulation with robotic systems. And then uh, the last, uh, the corner, the lower right example here on uh, remote expertise is actually where sort of Christine saw us at, at Ismar looking at future technologies for doing digital teleportation into realistic environments. So if you want to bring remote expertise into sort of an industrial environment and, and working space. So if you go up the stack a little bit in our hardware software theme, we have people that are working on near zero sensor sensor near zero power sensor systems. So things that could, for example, harvest energy from the environment and operate uh, indefinitely. This picture over on the right is actually a very small solar powered uh, camera system that came out of one of our uh, faculty, Brandon Lucia at CMU's group where they're actually doing solar powered cameras that can run um, small sort of neural network accelerators on device to do things like uh, object classification and find people in the environment. And we have a, a bunch of folks working on different sensors and, and actuator hardware. Uh, in theme three, we're looking at sort of the security required for a lot of these new sort of spatial computing type environments. And one thing that you will get to in the arena architecture is that doing um, isolation and software sandboxing is extremely important. And so in the, uh, in the arena platform, you'll see how we actually think about next generation distributed systems where you can have agile programs that sort of migrate around um, the system in a safe and, and secure manner. Uh, in terms of machine learning, everybody of course is working on machine learning these days. One kind of interesting difference in our philosophy around machine learning is that we don't just use machine learning for what it can bring to an application in terms of capabilities. So imagine being able to do very cool image recognition or feature point tracking, but we're also looking at how we can use machine learning to actually tune the underlying system stack. So using machine learning to improve uh, system performance in a sort of autonomous way. Uh, next theme on uh, communication positioning and control the big uh, sort of takeaway there is this is where a lot of the tracking work for um, 
for the uh, arena platform comes from. So being able to do GPS denied positioning, uh, location and tracking, uh, all comes in, in that theme. And a, a little bit of the robotics work that, you're see, that you'll see comes from there. Um, and then finally, just to sort of cap it off, there's a theme that's around programming and resource management, where we look at um, basically how do you how do you program next generation mixed reality systems. So, um, with all of that as a little bit as the backdrop, I want to sort of get to the heart of the the technical talk today, which is really around our Arena platform. So Arena stands for the Augmented Reality Edge Networking Architecture, and our high level goal here has been to create a framework for multi-user, multi-application. Uh, mixed reality systems where you can simplify programming user apps that connect with other users as well as components in the physical world. So if you kind of look at uh, some of the features that Arena brings to the table, it's really about location-based content discovery. So this is something you're probably familiar with coming from the cloud AR community. Um, it's cross-platform by nature, so you'll see how we can actually run applications on a wide variety of of different targets. Obviously, there's the programmability side of it. Um, it's implicitly networked, so we'll talk about what that means when we dive into the details, but basically you can have programs that run on multiple different devices that are all painting their information into sort of a common XR fabric. Um, and of course, safe and secure hosting of, of applications. So one thing that's kind of unique to Arena is we often refer to it as a spatial web platform. And I want to spend a couple minutes to describe what we mean by spatial web and why that's important for, for mixed reality systems. So to give a little bit of context, if we think about what the traditional current web is, it's basically a, something, if you look at sort of the original vision of the web, it's of course migrated and it's evolved into this uh, complex beast that we see today. But the original idea was to have content that you could then map to different platforms. So you could have an HTML page that you view on a laptop, a, a phone, or, or a, a mobile watch. We had interpreters for that content. So these would be web browsers. Um, and then of course, depending on which target platform you're running on, you could uh, render that content in a sort of context-aware specific way. So really the idea behind the web was isolating content and bringing it to a platform-specific rendering. If you think about the vision of the spatial web, it's similar in that you still want to have content, but one thing that's changed is that the physical world is now sort of a first order um, input into that system. We have new platforms. Some of them are the same, some of them are new. So of course you'd want something that works on mobile phone devices and perhaps laptops, but also platforms like uh, headsets, if you think about the browsers, so some of the same players are there, so Firefox, Edge, Chrome. We have some new ones, so for example, Oculus or Firefox Reality, they have what are called reality browsers. And then where this really gets interesting is your interpretation of that data, depending on the platform, is now highly variable. So if you're in a VR environment, like up here, you basically uh, see sort of uh, a 3D world that you could open up in a desktop browser. If you're in wearing a VR headset, you might see, of course, more immersive VR. And then uh, probably the most exciting to us is when you're in mixed, if you're in actually true mixed reality with augmented headsets, you can see that same content overlaid in the physical world. So maybe just a quick example of that. So here is a scene opening, uh, this is actually an arena scene, opened up in a Firefox browser where you can see there's sort of a 3D model of in this case, it's a plant shelf, and you can see there's a little bit of AR content that's running on top of it, these apps that are here. So this would be in a desktop browser if you went to this scene, as we'll, we'll talk a little bit about later. If you, and you know, there, this is basically a small application that's running, that's keeping track of how often we need to water and fertilize our plants. And believe it or not, this is actually something from my lab. So this is, this is literally a, a shelf that's behind us now, and we have these, uh, these um, XR apps that are able to, to help us keep track of watering cycles. If you look at that same scene through Oculus Quest 2's browser, um, it you know it looks similar, but now you're in a fully immersive VR. So you kind of get you get hands, you can teleport around. If you look at it through mobile AR, so again, this is the same room, and now you can actually see the real the real world in the background, you see that same content anchored in mobile reality. And then if you, uh, mobile mixed reality, and then if you look at wearing something like uh, 
a HoloLens, you can actually open up the Edge browser on HoloLens and uh, see all of that information overlaid. So one of the, the really exciting things here is that that same scene and program that we wrote runs across all of these different platforms and multiple users can be interacting with all of this content at the same time. So I could have somebody who's in that scene in VR, I can be there in AR, and I can actually sort of interact um, across those, those boundaries. So that gives you a little bit of a, a backdrop to Conix, um, a little bit of an intro to Arena and an idea of what we mean by spatial web. I think at this point, I'm gonna hand over to, uh, to Nuno to talk a little bit about sort of the system challenges and to go into a little bit more how the underlying architecture actually works. Thanks, Anthony, absolutely. So <clears throat> while building uh, our ARENA platform, we had in mind some particular systems challenges that we wanted to address. Uh, one of them is how we would be finding content to display in our uh, ARENA scenes. Uh, the other one would be how we have multiple users and how we can share uh, the state in a scene so that these multiple users can see this uh, scene in a consistent and uh, synchronized state. Of course, when we have that, when we are sharing this state between multiple users, we also have to want to do this uh, with some security, particularly because in Arena we also can uh, launch different applications inside a, inside a scene. So uh, we want to be able to uh, define access control and how these users can uh, manipulate and interact with the system. And finally, I kind of hinted uh, about this, how we put this uh, entire thing together and how we ho host applications and let uh, users view this content and interact with these applications. So now I'm going to do like a quick uh, overview uh, of how Arena works from a, from a high level. So let's do a little bit of a tour of how users could uh, find content and interact with a particular uh, scene, with a particular set of content uh, in, in Arena. So the first thing is to uh, find uh, this content. We use something we call Atlas to uh, find content that is near us. Um, uh, besides this content, we also get details about what are the compute resources that are around us that we can use to execute our applications in Arena. So as we find this content, for example, we uh, want to open a 3D chess application and we decide to uh, load this application and uh, we start, in this case, the application in a certain device nearby and also in the uh, user's headsets. As the application starts, we can see on the left side uh, what is uh, the underlying uh, pub sub topic structure that we have running in Arena. So the first few nodes are just to show you that we could have topics for different scenes. The last topic, the 3D chess scene, is the program that we are just about to open. And this one could have topics that represent user I.O. and also topics for each of the programs and users that are uh, running inside the scene. So as the program loads, um, the users that are in this scene, so the users that are interested in this content, would receive uh, messages to draw content that they would represent. And this would show up as uh, another topic inside this topic structure, as you can see on the left. Uh, as users interact with uh, this scene, for example, a user does a click on, on the 3D chess board, it would uh, be sent to whoever was interested, in this case the program uh, running on the running on, on the, the embedded device. And you can you can see uh, this would be sent in a in a particular topic that represents input from that user on the left side. And then uh, this would eventually uh, trigger the application to send an update to uh, to uh, to to both users that would be uh, sent and in this case, for example, create a circle that would be seen by all the users. Uh, and eventually, for example, we could start a new program that would create yet another object that would be uh, distributed to everyone interested uh, in this scene again. 
Um, so this is kind of a tour of uh, how uh, this ar uh, architecture is put together. And now I'm going to show you just a little bit uh, of a video that demonstrates some application running on Arena. So the first thing you can see here is that we're opening a browser and you will quickly see here, uh, you will quickly see here uh, the interface uh, the interface of our atlas well, that is showing two scenes that you can see nearby. So we load one of the scenes and then we enter into AR and as we enter in AR we use that tag on the floor to localize uh, ourselves inside the scene. You will also notice that other users, other devices can be seen and they are represented in this case with, with a head. In this scene they are represented that way. So uh, we start walking around our scene and you can see that uh, we have synchronized state between the two users and we have this application down here that is a wayfinding application. So we click on it and it shows a path to inside the kitchen. As you can see now, we also had some integration with uh, the lighting system and you can see a very simple way uh, of interacting from Arena into some IoT devices here where we, when we click uh, it actually uh, turns on the lights. So we continue and we show a little bit more uh, uh, examples of interaction with the lighting system. And then we go back and what we will see now is actually a new program and you quickly saw that it relocalized when we, it saw the tag, uh, you will see that we will be launching an, a program uh, in a device that it's on the table. So this is a tic-tac-toe, just to show you that we can launch programs from different devices that interact with the same in the same scene. And you see the two users uh, playing the tic-tac-toe. So you can see the different perspectives from the two devices in, uh, in this scene and you can see how uh, users interact with, with the scene. So now continuing, we have yet another wayfinding application. You see an April tag back there in the corner that was used to relocalize. And this wayfinding application would tell us to go, to go upstairs in the house. So this is kind of a quick tour of some applications and uh, uh, of Arena actually working. Uh, let's do now a tour of the entire architecture. So we've talked about Atlas that allows us to find what we call arena realms that are really just a set, a set of services and devices in a particular area. These set of services inside the realm, they, they communicate through a pub sub uh, structure that is uh, organized as we saw in the example before. And inside the realm, we usually have a set of services that are supporting that realm, such as access control, persistence for our, for our scenes, uh, and some ways of serving static content. Uh, importantly, we also have uh, different devices that we call viewer devices, and we assume these devices, these viewing devices to be based on a browser stack. So they are capable of running a, a browser that is WebXR capable and they run this uh, web uh, stack that you can see here. And they are able to, to display our arena scenes. And finally, we also consider in the architecture some headless devices that can provide sensing and interact also with the scene. All of these, you will see, they can uh, run a common runtime that is where we run our applications isolated. So we have yet another example here uh, of um, how we can uh, do a collaborative editing of scenes in Arena. So we see on the left side two AR users. So this is the perspective from two iPads of uh, users in the same scene. And on the right side, you can see what you would see if you enter the same scene, but from, uh, from for example, a desktop browser. So you see a VR scene, uh, but you can see that all of the views are synchronized and the two AR users are interacting with this scene. They have a very simple uh, interface that will build a very simple arena application to place 
content in, in the scene and uh, uh, manipulate these objects. So you can see we're like changing color, uh, adding new content and so on. So um, as kind of the back backdrop infrastructure for uh, uh, Arena, we are, cons are considering, we are creating this runtime, this infrastructure to execute our applications. Um, and different from normal uh, uh, applications, normal uh, applications that can run on the cloud, we actually uh, want to have like a mix of uh, some compute that can run on the cloud and compute that will be running on the edge and namely uh, have support some interactions between the edge devices that are usually time sensitive. So to, to create our spatial computing runtime, we have to consider uh, distribution, security and timeliness as first order citizens. Um, and our main uh, abstraction is to have a way that we can uh, run our applications across the network. So opposite from like traditional applications that run inside uh, an OS uh, with some process that uh, relies on the on the operating system to to do some communication between the process and to keep some state about the running of of the application. We are working on an abstraction that we call a nano process that really the most important thing about them is the fact that they can run on anywhere on the network. And we do this based on a technology uh, that exists, uh, WebAssembly, to run these uh, securely, but also to have uh, these encapsulated um, uh, uh, entities that we can run across the network, across different platforms, different OSs, and including in uh, different browsers. And actually, maybe you know, one thing to to mention here: yeah. one of the interesting aspects of being able to use WebAssembly as a transport is that it's not just running in desktop machines, servers, and clients, but even in microcontrollers. So if you think about industrial automation systems, where you've got sensors and actuators on the factory floors in machinery um, we actually have an avenue for our, our software to launch and run on, on those types of targets as well yep absolutely so while we can uh, develop applications really on um, uh, any language that is supported by this nano process based runtime that we are creating we do think that currently the best way to develop applications for Arena is using Python because it's just like it's just much easier to to uh, to use, and we created a library that makes it easy to interact with uh, Arena scenes. So you can create an update uh, object, you can create animations, you can do callbacks on events, and you can uh, interact with the persistence database to see what is the current state of, of a certain scene. And um, so this is something that we uh, have as the preferred way to develop applications. You can see a very simple example on the right side. Uh, we're not going through the details, but you can see how you create a scene object that connects to a certain scene at a certain host and then you can define um, uh, functions that can run uh, in intervals on events and and so on in this case it's a it's a function that only runs once the main and it will just load two objects in this case two gltf models uh, load it into the scene and then define uh, a simple animation uh, in in this uh, in these objects. So we'll actually show this uh, this program running, but this will be uh, an object of the Earth, an object of the Moon, and the Moon uh, animating to go around uh, around the Earth. So this is a very simple example of an application uh, written in Python for the Arena. So here you can see um, uh, an example where we have two browsers, so these two browsers are connected, opening the same scene, you can see the URL, 
And what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to show you is how to run a that Python program. So we'll start by defining what is the scene that we're connecting to. So we have ways of overriding the scene so that we can target uh, applications to different scenes. And what you saw there is the uh, authentication workflow. So when you connected, you had to provide your credentials to connect to Arena. And you can, you can see both browsers are synchronized, so they both loaded these objects, they both loaded this program uh, at the same time. And now we're showing you how to uh, start another program that is just creating random green boxes in the scene, as you see, as you see here. And you can also see the view that you would get from uh, an AR device. So the same scene being uh, looked at from three different viewpoints, from two browsers in VR and uh, uh, a browser in AR. And we also had a visit from our, our colleague. It's actually not Nuno, this is Malesh. <laughs> Okay, so this was uh, yet another example of uh, some applications running in the arena, and you can see how we go across uh, these desktop browsers and AR browsers. So now I'm going to hand it back to, to Anthony that will tell us about uh, how we anchor content in the real world. Cool. So, so one of the things you probably noticed in that video is if you're in VR, you're sort of immersed in a totally synthetic environment. But in that AR view of the Earth and the Moon, that was actually anchored in the the center of our lab. And so one question is, how do you how do you actually manage and do that relocalization? We have a, a bunch of different tools that we can use as part of Arena, since you know having this sort of agile, highly extensible, pluggable architecture um, makes it easy to connect external trackers. So for example, in the middle here, you can see an example of an OptiTrack system. So this is an outside-in tracker, also similar to sort of Lighthouse Vive. On the left side, you can see the sort of more common, um, easy to put together system where we just use, uh, in this case, April tags or optical markers. Um, we have some that are sort of fixed that can set coordinate uh, anchor points. We have some that are mobile, for example, if you want to attach devices to them. And then on the right side, we have uh, some work that's uh, coming out of my lab that's actually built around ultra wideband uh, RF ranging technology. So. You've probably heard of the U1 chip that's now in the new Apple phones that does uh, uh, range, that basically does ranging between other iOS devices. There's also AirTags that uses this technology. Um, we've been using it a lot for our GPS denied position navigation and, and timing work. And what you can do with UWB is you can basically either put beacons in the environments and you can precisely localize devices based off of that by you know, simulating what's very similar to indoor GPS, or in some of our most recent work, you can actually have a completely ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer system where every device is ranging uh, between each other, tracking their inertial uh, motion with, you know, visual inertial odometry plus accelerometers and rate gyros, and be able to bootstrap a completely relative localization infrastructure. And we actually have a, a new paper on that topic um, that should be publicly available in, in about a week or so. It was actually just accepted today. Super happy for the student. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so any of these different types of ways to anchor to reality um, are all sort of naturally built into Arena. So that's sort of one of the nice benefits of using the platform. I want to show um, another example here of a, of a demonstration. This was actually a system that was built by some of our collaborators at UCLA, Paolo Tavoida's lab where they do control experiments. And so they do a lot of work on sort of drones and, and control. And here they're looking at a distributed control application. But you can basically see on the left, a drone that's flying around with its digital twin mirrored into the arena. And you can see it's doing, you know, there's some handoff between control. We actually had a uh, demonstration day where they wanted to show this system to a bunch of sponsors. And so what they did was they quickly set up this scene in the arena where they could show video feeds as sort of poster boards. They have like live posters off to the left. And one of the nice aspects of arena is the sort of social engagement part, which largely came out of the pandemic. We actually needed to build a platform where we could all interact with each other. And so anybody in a remote browser or VR headset can join into this environment and we can all sort of collaborate together. And this was really one of these 
magical moments where we're like, wow, mixed reality, you know, even as a tool for sort of communication and working is, is just fantastic. And so um, this is literally just a screen capture of, you know, an ad hoc moment that happened that day where um, this, you know, the students were basically talking about this control application, but in this sort of fully immersive arena environment. So the other thing that's uh, worth mentioning is from a development perspective, we've focused a lot on low level tools, like being able to write Python programs. One thing that we've uh, done more recently is we now actually have Unity integration. So on the right hand side here, you can see an example of an arena scene in a browser being live mirrored into Unity. So you can actually design applications in Unity. You can do authoring and staging in Unity. We can actually use Unity as its own standalone runtime environment that plugs into into the arena system so for example you want to use a, if you want to use unity's physics engine go ahead and do it um, i also as a huge huge fan of blender want to put in the shameless plug that we also have a, a blender export capability so you can also do your staging in blender blender is awesome i literally have a knit blender hat sitting next to me right now but uh, i want to make sure that um, it's clear that you can also basically export scenes from Blender. We'll probably get to tools like Maya and those things uh, down the road, but want to hit the big open source projects first. So this last uh, this last component really goes to what uh, Christine saw in the Ismar competition, where we were basically taxed with the challenge of creating a hybrid conference experience. So something where uh, some people would be remote, some people would actually be physically in place. And so what we did was we used the arena's ability to stitch a bunch of I.O. together to build out sort of a, a futuristic uh, conference experience. So the first thing that we did was we would scan the venue where the conference would be held. So that was a Leica BLK360 um, terrestrial LiDAR based scanner. You create a model of the environment. So this is the building that uh, Nuno and I are in right now. And here's an example of what would happen if uh, somebody joined in virtual reality. Um, and then this is an example of what somebody would see if they were in mobile AR. You could also wear a headset. So you can see that they can actually interact with the VR um, people remotely. I don't know if it was if it was clear. Let me back up a second there. Um, so you're in the VR world. You can see some of the applications. The AR person can actually see and communicate with that VR person. So this is both audio and video. We actually support spatial audio. So you hear the sound coming from the right place if you're in, in VR, which is kind of nice. Um, and then you'll see as you walk into the actual venue, we have a, a modified Magic Leap headset with um, a, a selfie cam, basically. There's a camera connected to it, a wide angle camera that captures the speaker so that when the speaker is wearing the headset, um, people in VR will actually see a cube with the video feed coming with the audio. This is an example of somebody in the space using AR uh, mashed up on top of what the VR scene would be. So you can actually see that there's the video feed on, on top of me in this case um, with some of the, uh, the VR components. Was that the end of that video? Or did that... I think so. Hold on. I had a little bit more. I feel like that just jumped. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, no, there's definitely more. So here's the sort of uh, AR view in the space. You can see remote participants in VR are actually overlaid so the speaker can see them. This is a view of what that space looks like in AR. So remember the, the or in VR, the backdrop there is uh, the backdrop of that was actually the scanned model. So that's why I know this is probably the most confusing video we can we can show people. Um, but this is a sort of a VR view of that same environment. Uh, we also have these two-way portals. So it's a screen on both sides of the camera facing each way. And if you're in the real world, you see into VR. If you're in the VR world, you see a live capture into AR that's again in that scanned model. So really sort of bringing together uh, these types of, of natural interactions. Um, Another uh, another example, when we uh, actually did the demonstration for Ismar, we took a scan of my lab. So this is my lab space. So right now, actually, Nuno and I are talking in this room uh, right here. And we had a projector that was sort of simulating uh, giving a talk. We had some elements that we put in the space, like being able to live stream cameras or you know digital content. 
we have a portal that was placed here um, to sort of uh, give a sense of, of the landscape. And so one thing that we really highlighted in the ISMAR demo was the use of this portal to like continuously be able to look back and forth between AR and VR. So again, if you're in the real world as a user, you can look at the screen that's sitting there and see that exactly aligned keyframe of the VR world behind it. The camera from the portal on both sides is projecting the real world as a screen in the VR environment that a VR person would see. And then the interesting thing here is that anybody walking around with a mobile phone in the real world, their camera uh, grabs their face to project them onto an entity in the VR space. Um, but the camera also tracks their location precisely so that they're keyed uh, in the right location. And we have a small demo of what that actually looks like. So here's Ivan, who's walking through the door in that scan space. Oops. And you can see, I don't know if you guys noticed, but basically on the left side here, this is a VR view. Um, as he walks through with his phone, you can see his face move through the space. There's actually Mike, who's another one of our core developers, so it's in VR that you could see. And then likewise, if I look through to see the VR version of it, again, that's what you see. So again, cool. just this really tight coupling between uh, AR, VR, and being able to easily create these multi-modality mashups is what the arena is really all about. Cool. So in summary, uh, you know, the arena, it's really designed to simplify programming, uh, these mixed reality systems. It allows you to author and host geographically anchored content. We have a lot of people working on sort of the safe and secure runtime component of this. Um, you probably got a sense for this in the background, but that whole scene graph and tree has access control permissions and knobs attached to it. It's all open source. So you can go on arenaxr.org. You can actually log in and test out VR and actually chat with people if you want to. You can send around a link. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have a uh, open source browser that's actually on the iOS app store. So the, the browser that you use from the mobile phone side, you can download that and also connect to Arena Scenes. For Android, we have support uh, that's going to be in the latest version of Chrome. Right now, you have to get a beta version of Chrome and enable a debugging flag but this will all soon be uh, completely accessible within uh, sort of a standard Chrome environment. And just for reference, a couple of useful links, arenaxr.org, we have some documentation, we have source code online. These are some example scenes that you can actually just drop into the web browser and uh, explore a little bit. And I definitely would welcome everybody to go ahead and do that. Here's a, a picture of our team. And I, of course, wanna thank all of our sponsors from SRC. Uh, and I heard that this is gonna be posted on YouTube, so you should definitely like, subscribe, and hit the bell <laughs> if you haven't already. Cool, thank you. Be happy to, to take some questions. Great, thank you. That was just really, really perfectly well-timed, and the content um, was also very, very appropriate, so. Um, I see uh, somebody has raised his hand, so he's not quite following the protocol, but since it's somebody who I know very well, and um, <laughs> I'm gonna unmute um, Dan McPeters, and then we'll get on to some of the questions that uh, are coming in from our other audience members. Okay, so Dan, I think you are unmuted. Can you? Yeah, I'm, I'm Generation X, so we politely raise our hand even on the internet. Uh, quick, uh, so uh, we have uh, some situations where you might not be able to get accurate GPS readings uh, from uh, on on your device or mobile device or even your head mounted display. Is there um, in the pipeline or currently available in the arena platform um, local positioning or any other kind of uh, supplemental um, geolocating capability. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's, yeah. A great, that's, that's a great question, and I actually think that um, the uh, relocalization problem is one of the big barriers right now for for really getting XR systems out in the wild. Um, so on that front, we we actually have a lot we have a lot of work 
uh, probably for really sort of GPS denied locations where you can't easily put up optical markers. I would, I would recommend using some of these ultra wideband based systems. Um, and as I mentioned, we actually have some, some brand new work that's um, going to be publicly available, at least on my website, uh, relatively shortly that talks about some of that technology. But um, maybe the short answer is, is yes. And, and part of it is also not just being able to do the positioning, but being able to actually bootstrap that infrastructure. There's one thing to say, we have a technology that works in a in a lab environment, uh, there's a very different thing to say we have something that other people can actually set up where you don't have, you know, five PhD students uh, having to, uh, to baby and shepherd the process. Um, it's also worth mentioning that some of the research funding for the lab comes from NIST, um, which is, you know, normally people think of them as the government entity that does standards, but they uh, also have a program that works with public safety uh, operators. And as part of the NIST program, we've been working on a lot of rapidly deployable GPS denied tracking for law enforcement, search and rescue, and firefighters. And that same technology is exactly what you need for, for mixed reality. And in fact, for firefighters, they're thinking mixed reality is a great way to uh, boost situational awareness and actually let different firefighters see where their team is in real time. So that's a big, big focus in my lab. I'm happy to follow up offline and chat more about different technologies on that front. Great. Thank you, Anthony. I think one of the things you mentioned indirectly over and over and over again is that the arena platform can be set up in a private network, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that would certainly be one of the requirements for many of the industry segments that you mentioned, but even large, um, large enterprises that have sensitive information. So can can you describe a little bit what infrastructure is needed for a private um, arena platform deployment? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first thing to note, and we've posted the links there. You can go to to those links and get all the source code uh, for for arena. But importantly, you can also get their instructions on how to set up your own your own instance. All you're going to need in terms of infrastructure is uh, our deployment is based on docker containers so you're going to have you're going to need some infrastructure to run those a few a few containers that have uh, uh the needed supporting services for an arena realm as we described in the in the architecture so you would basically have your own private arena realm uh, for yourself as a reference in terms of the infrastructure like we use for example AWS D3 instances that are more than enough uh, with 8 gig of memory uh, that are more than enough to run you know all of the services inside the same the same machine we've even mm -hmm. uh, we've toyed with the idea of getting arena to run on a raspberry pi it's a little bit of a, a stretch but conceptually possible yep. so it can it can theoretically <laughs> run on a pretty thin plan <laughs> Right. In fact, that's another question is, have you done stress testing in terms of, the, of testing the, the limits of number of users or number of devices in an yeah. instance? Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, we have, um, we have a paper from Ismar uh, on the arena architecture that you can find on, on my website. So if you go to my academic website, search for Anthony Rowe, CMU, um, then search for arena under publications. But uh, in terms of scale, for for example, for our conference we run for, for Conex, we've had uh, over 80 users connected simultaneously. They've all, they were all sharing audio and video in their cubes moving around the space. Um, so you kind of get a sense that in terms of users, we're able to scale out certainly to close to 100 per scene. But one of the nice aspects of Arena is that you can then host you know, almost an infinite number, I don't want to say infinite, but a very, very large internet scale number of scenes that can be spread across different servers. So right now, sort of one one scene, so one virtual space that you're in, uh, you're limited largely by just the video capacity at, at around a, at 100. If people shut off video, you could probably go much further than that. But then the idea is that these scenes can tile at very large scale across the internet. Mm -hmm, mm hmm Fascinating. Yeah, and if you have um, 
Yeah, NVIDIA servers and other things like that, you can get the graphics performance up to where it's tolerable. Yeah, so so maybe one uh, one one interesting thing that people notice is like this is all web based, and people say, well, you know, I don't think of performance when I think of the web. And there's there's sort of two things to note. One is that uh, web performance has come a long way, so websites are actually quite complicated programs now, often. And the connection from the graphics that you see in the web to the underlying hardware is actually quite 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 uh, it's a quite quite a quick connection. What am I trying to say here? There's not much uh, between taking the sort of graphics commands at the web and going straight down to OpenGL underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. um, you actually get pretty good performance. Really, the issue is loading big models and things like that. So one thing that our team has just started exploring is uh, leveraging cloud cloud-based rendering architectures. And you mentioned uh, NVIDIA's services. They have a nice cloud rendering system. Um, and yeah. so we actually think that you'll be able to do sort of what people call hybrid um, cloud rendering, where you can render some of the components locally, and then you can actually go to the to the cloud to render, you know, Hollywood VFX style graphics that could be an overlay inside your AR stream if you have a really good network connection. If your network mm -hmm. starts to drop out, that's where the hybrid becomes uh, important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Um, this is a lot of great information, a lot for people to, to process. I hope these are not entirely new concepts, at least at the general level, And um, but very exciting work. We look forward to reading your, um, your next publications, all of them, <laughs> and to having you come back. Um, and tell us uh, more about you know the status in in a, a year's time or or something along those lines. I do want to make sure that all those who want to reach um, this team uh, can can uh, do so. And you, email is the best best way to reach you. What what um, yeah what yeah, would you prefer? Yeah, yeah. If you, uh, if okay, you I'm email. Just putting, I just put uh, Anthony's email address into the chat, and I'm just putting Nuno's into the chat as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention um, The only thing today. maybe to add is if you go yes, to that uh, arenaxr.org, if you go, I think it's like uh, more details or something, you can actually find the Slack link that you can join on Arena. And uh, yeah, if you want to ask questions about Arena in particular, about uh, meet the developers, the people working on it, uh, you will definitely, that's that's a good place to, to go. Yeah, so if you go to arenaxr.org, you click on learn more, it takes you to community, and then you get um, links to documentation, but then also, of course, uh, a way to connect to Slack if you want to ask developer questions or uh, anything like that. Great, I just, yep. point, I just pasted those links into the chat, so. I will be definitely promoting this tomorrow during our research committee meeting, and um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you for your attention and a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thanks, gentlemen. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.